Uh, you're Marge Petty. I'm Sarah Tucker. This is uh, January 10th, 1991, and this is an oral history as part of the Washburn University Kansas Legislative Women Project. My first question is a general one. How did you come to get in politics? I saw it, I think, as an opportunity um, to make some changes or have some influence um, in an area geographically where I had lived for almost 15 years and complained periodically about the way it operated. And I remember having a conversation with my sister who lived in Oklahoma and she said, you know, there are women in politics here and um, the men knew more, no more than the women did necessarily about the business of operating the city budget and so forth. And so that was one factor. I thought, I, I want to make a contribution, and I, why not, basically. Uh, secondly, there was a change in the form of government here in Topeka, and it was something that I could do and balance family commitments and other professional commitments at the same time. And I think, um, Thirdly, it goes back to really, I guess, the idea of, of why not that um, I felt I had a contribution that I could make, and this was the opportunity. So your first public office was the Topeka City Council? That's right. And you ran in 1980? I ran in 1985, okay. and um, it was at a time when the change in the form of government occurred. So there were representative districts. Oh, and none of them had incumbents, so this was a That's right. great and, opportunity. That's um, right. There were some former commissioners, city commissioners, who ran. There were, as I recall, some 90-something candidates. So each district was had a, a multitude of choices, basically. I think there were nine in my primary. Good heavens. Um, it was the first time, I believe, that women had been elected to the city offices, and there were two women elected at that particular time. Okay, so then in 1988 you ran for and were elected to the Kansas Senate, um, 18th district? That's right. 18th district. That's right. Um, how did you come to get nominated and win that election? Well, again, I think there was a window of opportunity. Um, I ran against an incumbent who was also a woman. My sense was in terms of the opportunity for my district. It might not come along again because she was first term. I think there were enough contrasts in the way we operated and our public experience that I felt at least the uh, voters had a choice. I'd been previously elected deputy mayor the second year when I served on the city council. and really loved the politics. My mother used to say about me, I never liked to sleep because I was always afraid I would miss something. <laughs> so <laughs> That's wonderful. So did you have any trouble getting nominated or um, for the Democratic? No, basically, they were waiting. I think the Democratic Party was waiting for whoever was willing to take on the challenge. Okay. And with this particular race, I think the incumbent was viewed as rather formidable. And I think basically it was open to whoever was willing to take the risk of running against her. Good definition of politics. So how and why did you win? That's a good question. And um, first of all, I thought very long and hard before I ran. I didn't want to win and lose. And I wanted to make certain that um, I was clear on the profile I had publicly, that I had some assessment of what my opponent's profile was and uh, where our weaknesses and strengths were and how those complemented one another. Um, I actually went about this the same way I go about a lot of things, which is a, a pretty definitive planning process. I did. I had a um, poll taken. 
It was very specific to outline profiles of each of ours and identified really where our strengths and weaknesses were. That was one key thing. The other uh, aspect was I worked real hard. <laughs> and uh, I think when you, when you run against an incumbent, and my earlier um, experience at the city level, I ran against a semi-incumbent who had mm -hmm. held public office before as well. You just never stop. And you always assume that you could lose by 20 votes and they were the last 20 votes that you could have knocked uh, the doors of the night before the election. And I was out knocking on doors the night before the election. Um, so I, I worked very hard. I think also I was underestimated. There were many people, including, I would say I had a handful of perhaps five friends who thought I could win. And many people who said, why in the world are you doing this? Some of it, I think, my willingness to take the risk stems from my upbringing. I grew up in an area where um, the ethic was risk-taking. Not necessarily for women but that there was a risk-taking ethic. And um, when I decided my plan, I felt I could win. And, but it was, it was interesting because it was a little bit like pulling teeth. I mean, you could actually feel the wave of resistance and pulling people along to support you. And then, then I could feel it turn. But there was a long period there when um, I was basically doing it on my own. And um, I think anybody that gets into politics has to be willing to do it on their own. What you get is a gift, but you cannot go in expecting anyone to support you. And um, I'll have to say I s that, that would be the fourth factor that I did not do it alone. At, at one point, that there were some very critical people who were there when I needed them. And then the numbers uh, began to increase in terms of people supporting. So who are these critical people? Um, I would say basically some people that believed in me couple of good friends, mm -hmm. um, a person that I served with in public office, um, I think there was some hesitancy on the part of family. I'm not sure. I think, uh, I think my husband felt that I could do it and um, And actually, I'll, if you'd like, I can talk more about that. But I would say those Sooner key, the, you know, those those key people were probably more colleagues, professional colleagues, in terms of being out there saying, "Go for it." Can you tell me who they were? I mean, I'm oh, you want specific names, or at least male or female, um, experienced I, or not? I would say it was balanced. Balanced in terms of male and female. Okay. Um, did they help you with strategy? Did they help you say, this is how to take the polls, this is what your strength, strong points were, or do you, did you really do that and they said, go for it, whatever you want to do is good? I think it was a balance also. I had a sign on my mirror that said 85% um, of the incumbents win to Ooh. remind me every morning when I got up that if I was serious about it, I needed to focus and um, I needed to be out there. And also that commitment, once I decided to do that, I realized the commit was, commitment was more f than for just, just for me. Mm -hmm. that it was a commitment on behalf of the party mm -hmm. and um, that I needed to do a good job. Mm -hmm. Did you get very much help from the, the party organization? I, in many ways, yes. Um, there was... There was a key person that was part of my previous campaign mm -hmm. who is very good at um, assessing the impact people can have on the public. 
I would say in a sense he was a really wonderful marketing consultant. Um, I had a couple of friends who knew me well enough who asked me whether or not I could be um, I hate to use the word tough enough, but that that what beating an incumbent requires is first of all giving a voter a reason to replace mm -hmm. the incumbent. And they weren't sure whether I'd be willing to do that or not. So part of it was a growing process for me in many ways. Um, and I worked very hard to stick to the facts in terms of voting record and not get personal. Mm -hmm. Primarily, be, well, for several reasons. One, personally, I liked the person I was running against. Um, you know, our profiles in many ways and our friends are very similar. Mm -hmm. Um, our styles are, are somewhat similar. Um, so I wasn't in any way interested in um, damaging her personally. But I felt like in terms of a representative of the people that I could do a better job. And that's what I had to convince the people mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds fair. Uh, this kind of leads into then something I wanted to, to talk about. In terms of issues, what were the issues that you brought up, and what issues do you think may have made a difference for your victory? I think there are a couple of key issues. Um, one is a procedural issue, in a sense, and one is um, a fact issue. I think when you are selling yourself to the public or to the voter, that message has to be consistent with who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, somebody gave me the example once that uh, when John Glenn ran for president and there were firecrackers and skyrockets going off behind him, it was not consistent with his persona. That basically he'd come from a farm, he was low-key, folksy type of person, and had the campaign been consistent with the way he was personally, it would have rung more true with mm -hmm. the public. Um, I have always been very careful that my message is consistent with the way I am personally. Uh, I'm a fiscal conservative. Mm -hmm. The so social issues I mean, I would much prefer to spend money on people rather than buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the issue, I think the, the, one of the primary issues was um, government efficiency, operating government more like a business, um, having the government be efficient with the tax dollars. And you felt that your opponent didn't say this, or you were able to convince people you do it better, or? Um, I can't answer that. I don't know, Sarah. You know, I, I, I think just in terms of the issue itself, the focus on being willing to fight for the changes that I saw mm -hmm. were necessary. Um, I have some specific <coughs> legislation that I'm going to be introducing in the next two or three weeks that deals specifically with fiscal issues, fiscal management, um, the kinds of choices that government makes. And I think government needs to be smarter in okay. this day and age. Um, do you feel the issue of um, pensions was important in your campaign? I do. I absolutely do, and primarily because, again, I think it's, uh, it's evidence of the responsibility that a public official has to the public, and the fact that there was a dichotomy made setting the legislature apart from the rest of the public as deserving more, I personally think was wrong. and. Um, I, I, and as I said earlier, you know, it's consistent with what I really believe. I believe it's wrong. 
And I happen to believe that when somebody is elected to the legislature, if they end up evolving to the point where they're elitist and figure that they've got all the answers, I think that's wrong too. You end up being out of touch with the people that you're representing. And I think the pension plan was a symbol of that. Okay. Uh, another question I'd like to ask is, in some of the interviews we've been doing, again and again we hear about women's organizations having been helpful in the campaign. Um, various women have told us that the League of Women Voters or um, the Federated Women's Clubs or the Junior League or whatever network of women they were part of was very helpful in their ability to have a campaign mechanism. Is this anything in your experience? Um, did you have a network like that? Were you able to use that? I had various networks of which I'd been a part. Mm -hmm. um, but quite frankly, the, uh, many of the networks were things like uh, the church where mm -hmm. I'd go. Um, I had previously been involved with the Women's Political Caucus mm -hmm. some years ago, and there were people with whom I'd made a connection that I'd stay in touch with and whatever. But as as far as it being under the, um, you know, having a cadre mm -hmm. of people who were members of a particular organization, it, I mean, I've, I had nurses help me because of my association with the health profession, and I had church people, and I had state employees. So, you know, there were... It was a mixture of different people. I would people. say, yes. Okay. But you certainly can't do it alone. You've got to rely on, on those networks you've already established. Once you got in the legislature, did you find a mentor or a group of people who were particularly helpful to you? How did you get going once you were part of the legislature? Well, quite frankly, I felt extremely grateful for the local experience because the system and the dynamics and the, the informal kinds of transactions that go on are very similar. The difference is you've got more people and there were new faces, but I would say as a freshman, I didn't feel green. I felt relatively comfortable in the setting. Um, in terms of people who were, re who were available, I would say the minority leaders, some of the some of the leadership mm -hmm. of the party uh, were helpful. And I think um, the fresh, the group that I came in with was particularly good. They were very bright. Many of them had, many of them were women, the majority of them were women. Mm -hmm. Each of us had probably served in some elected or appointed capacity um, in serving the public. So there was some familiarity with mm -hmm. those kinds of systems. And I think we supported one another. It wasn't as much a mentorship, perhaps, mm -hmm. as um, you know, being available for each other. And I'm also a great observer. Mm -hmm. There wasn't an official mentor that comes to my mind specifically, but um, I selected certain people to watch because in my observation or advocacy with the legislature in years past, I'd identified them as effective. So I kept an eye on how they, how they operated and had learned from them. So if I'm understanding it, first of all, you weren't green when you came in. You'd already had political experience. And then you feel as though you kind of learned by watching, knowing who to watch to begin with, and also you had a lot of colleagues you came in with that you could work with. Okay. Yes. Now I would certainly, in, in reference to not being green, I don't want to leave the impression that I knew everything because I think <laughs> you're, <laughs> that's a real mistake. You never know, in, in this <laughs> business, you never know everything. But I, I was not intimidated by the process. I okay, so. okay. Uh, what committees did you serve on when you first came into the legislature? Well, I, I was very lucky. I um, actually got every committee that I asked for, yeah, um, with the exception of one. I serve on the tax committee, I serve on judiciary, uh, I serve on local government, I serve um, as minority leader for labor industry and small business, 
and have just and then I also served on joint rules and regulations, which is a fascinating joint committee. They get all the regulations from the various departments, so um, you get to know a lot of the inner workings and the nuances of how your legislation is being implemented. The, um, however, I will not be on that. This coming session, and I've been appointed to the Economic Development Committee. So I have five stellar committees. I'm really thrilled. That's a lot of committees, isn't it? In the Senate, you end up with more, Sarah, okay. because there are fewer people. And Makes sense. Why is it you wanted those committees? What is it you're trying to do? Why did you think those would be good committees? I, I, it's my belief that the economic viability of the families and the state are centered around fiscal issues primarily. Tax, those economic development kinds of issues, job related, small business, those kinds of things. And I think as a woman I bring another perspective in than um, the men who may have a business orientation and understand all those nuances, which I, having just completed a law degree and having taken a lot of those corporation courses and whatever, I appreciate that, but there's an additional perspective, particularly with the, um, the projection that the major workforce is going to be minorities and women in the coming years, that I think we need to help to fashion a business community that's more responsive to that for the viability of everybody concerned. Now, in terms of judiciary, I was particularly interested in that because of, um, you know, my legal background. Mm -hmm. But the other committees really impact and impinge on, you know, family economics. Makes sense to me. How, well, can you describe and how would you describe the State House power structure um, that you met two years ago that you're still dealing with? That's a rather open-ended question. <laughs> sure is. <laughs> um, it's different in the House than in the Senate. My observations in the Senate is that um, with the influx of newly elected women, and we're talking almost 25 percent, there was a there's been a major shift in a relatively short time. Uh, 10, 11 years ago there was one member, one female member. 10 years later we now have almost one quarter of the body. It has much more of an effect, I think, when you've got a smaller body. Because you don't have as much anonymity as you do when you've got 125 members. Mm -hmm. um, your voice generally is listened to. There, are, there is more sharing of a voice, I think, when you have a smaller body. Mm -hmm. And I think it can work both ways. I think it can work with 25% of the body being female. I think it can work as a threat to an earlier power, stru power mm -hmm. structure. And what I see is really a transition right now, I think, in terms of power. Uh, you've got people that have been there almost 20 years from whom we can all learn mm -hmm. and um, and they're not certain how to relate to some of the new people. Mm -hmm. Many of us who are new want to respect that old, uh, that power system <laughs> and yet, um, you know, want to be heard as well. And I think each of us have gone about it in our separate ways that are more, um, that are sensitive to just our own personal style. Sure. So I think, um, I think the former power structure is evolving, but it's not going to happen overnight. And, and my interest is that it not be such a threat that it's counterproductive. Makes sense. Do you think the election of a female governor is going to change the Senate? Do you have any expectation for that? Speed up changes? 
Uh, or doesn't that seem really to have much impact? I'm not sure. I, I think, you know, I think at one level it does. And the level that I see it having an impact is that I have a personal belief that a female um, elected official brings a different quality than a male does. And that quality is that they are more likely to negotiate. Um, they are more likely to take into consideration more than what is just being said on the surface, but to listen for other um, thing, things that are being intended but not verbalized. So I think there's a different style that women generally bring in. Now, that's not always true. You've got exceptions. But um, I think some of the observations, at least in the Oregon, the new um, major minority, leader, uh, majority leader in Oregon, you know, th those kinds of examples, I think, hold, hold true. So I think there are people skills that come with a female governor. The strength that I see in her is that she really believes in people mm -hmm. and that she is very sensitive. She reads people very well and I think is um, has just marvelous people, people skills. My interest, I would certainly hope that, that we could all help her succeed. Being the first female woman, I think all women have an investment in seeing her do a good job. And I don't, I don't know how that's going to play out, quite frankly. I mean, we have, you know, majority uh, of the males are in both houses. And my hope is that they will treat her as a colleague, just as I expect to be treated. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe we're going to go through the same kind of evolution that I see in the Senate. You know, it's an abrupt change. And uh, one would assume that some of the younger people ideally would be more inclined to treat her as a colleague mm -hmm. and some of the older people um, maybe resent it a little bit but I, I don't I don't have any evidence to prove that's the case right now. Um, you mentioned that you have some some bills that you are planning to introduce and sponsor. Would you go into that a little more? What bills are you planning to to bring in this year? Um, I have, I'm particularly interested with the property tax problem, mm -hmm. that since about 98% of property tax is spent at the local level, that the opportunities for local government be expanded other than property tax. And I'm talking specifically user fees, mm -hmm. uh, in lieu of payments, um, for property that's tax exempt and yet the services are available to them. That particular issue is a matter of equity, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I have a particular bill I'm introducing that has to do with the uh, more technical probably than you want to get, but it's a recapturing of user f of the fees charged uh, by the court system and attorney mm -hmm. attorney's fees mm -hmm. in the district court. Shawnee County's had a great experience. Uh, in terms of an increase in a recapturing of those costs. Well, that increases revenue, you know, for local mm -hmm. government and the opportunity to decrease the dependency on uh, property tax. The other issue is... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The other issue, uh, Bill? Related to those local costs um, are certainly the uh, issues of the numbers of taxing units we have. Mm -hmm. Across the state we've got about 7,000 separate taxing units. Um, Kansas ranks eight in the numbers of elected officials statewide. And in the past it's been a source of pride. Well, there has been great resistance to any kind of consolidation of mm -hmm. some of those functions. If you've got a water problem, you may have six different entities that have some investment in how that problem is solved yet not one of those entities has the power to make the decision over the other entities. 
that's just one example mm -hmm. of the problems that are evolving because of these numbers of tax units. The impact also that it has on the taxpayers is obvious. You know, if you've got uh, several townships that could uh, operate in a larger township and share one road grader, you know, it's more efficient government. Mm -hmm. There's been real resistance to consolidation because people have, and it's a, it's a Kansas, uh, it's part of the Kansas heritage, I think, mm -hmm. that we own our own stuff. I mean, it's the, that um, independence that I think many of us value. But it has a cost. Mm -hmm. And as long as people know that that cost is there and are willing to pay for it and that that's part of the impact on property taxes, then fine. But I think there has been a gap in terms of educating people. Mm -hmm. So one of my bills has to do with educating people on the numbers of taxing units and how, in fact, that affects um, you know, their property tax. So those are local issues, then I've got other, a couple of other bills that I'm looking at in terms of state efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, something as mundane as the amount of storage space. Um, my daughter came to me the other night, she said, Mother, we really need a bigger house. And I said, you know, what we need to do is operate with what we have and use it better. And I think the same holds true. We spend almost $4 million on storage space from the state. And about 400000 of it we, is not our property. We lease it from someone else. Well, I can't help but believe that if there was a better system of examining what's being stored, how can we do that better mm -hmm. and more efficiently, that ultimately it would free up dollars to spend on people that are ne in need. My whole legislative package this year really will focus on the idea that we're at a time where we need to be clear about our priorities. Local government does, as well as the state government. And we need to go through a process where we're defining those priorities. And my, again, my, my emphasis would be to invest in the people and spend money that way, as opposed to in, you know, storing lots of forms <laughs> in somebody's <laughs> basement. <laughs> that way it sounds real good. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of coalition do you see yourself belonging to? Or if I'm putting coalition wrong, um, it sounds like you see yourself in the middle of the spectrum. Who do you see yourself working with then in the legislature? This is going back to how you operate and how you expect to accomplish. You're a Democrat. You obviously expect to work with your party, but um, do you have any plans for how you're going to accomplish these wonderful things? Who are you expecting to work with? Having served at the local level, which is nonpartisan, that was my primary experience to look at the issue as opposed to the party first. And I think I'd be considered a moderate Democrat generally. Um, it's real important to me to relate to people as people first mm -hmm. and not parties. So a lot of the issues that I look at, I am willing to, uh, in fact, some of the bills that I have already sponsored have bipartisan sponsorship and that particularly has to occur in the Senate because we're in the minority mm -hmm. um, and I have been very pleased at um, well first of all I like the people I work with on both sides of the aisle I have great respect for the amount of commitment that they mm -hmm. make I have great respect for the fact that many of them are don't think in the short term they are very policy oriented that's a luxury the Senate has, maybe that the House does not because our terms are for four years. But I mean, I can tell you people that have been there a long time, one of them I'm thinking of in particular, who had co a Republican who helped co-sponsor a bill with me last year. It, it did end up passing. Um, and I wrote him a thank you note, and he said, do you know this is the first time I have ever gotten a thank you note from a colleague? Well, you know, I like him personally. I mm -hmm. respect his opinion. And and it's not fabricated. Mm -hmm. It's real. And that's, I think, um, my expectation is those measures, which I think are important, are good government measures 
that everyone can support. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know the rest of my party sees me as a team player with them as well. But, um, you know, I don't build exclusive alliances. Sounds good. All right, just as a cleanup, because I kind of went past it, what would you say you have accomplished in your first two years? What bills have you sponsored or participated in? Um, issues you fought for or won, didn't win? Okay. Um, one of them in particular has to do with um, space planning. Um, not very um, flashy. No, you're making a pretty good case for it. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is that we've got, I'll give you an example. When the highway bill was passed, we had 150 new people who came on board. As part of that bill, it was never said, we're going to have 150 new people that we've got to have find space for. As a result, we had a building that was purchased outside of the downtown area, which in my mind is very important to keep viable. And it was stated, we've got to put these 150 uh, Department of Transportation people someplace the Kansas Corporation Commission said, well, we don't have enough space, we're going to move. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of nuances that were part of the, um, the planning that was done for that move. I contend, had there been a long-term, long-range plan on how much space do people need to operate in, what is our projection going to be, how can we use the space that we have better, do we want to um, store some of these files in the basement and free up office space that we could have saved the state a lot of money by not purchasing an additional building? So that, was, that particular bill was passed that put in place um, a requirement that departments project their space needs. And I think ultimately it can help the, uh, the uh, system run more efficiently. That, that's one thing. The other thing, of course, I've uh, participated um, quite a bit in the discussions and the negotiations on the tax issues. Incredibly frustrating because everybody wants it solved, but everybody has a different idea of how it ought to be done. Um, the other issues related to um, health care, I was in charge of a subcommittee that looked at the living will, the very first um, year that I was there. And certainly health care is going to be one of our primary concerns. So that will help, I think, alleviate some of the rising cost in health care. So some of those issues related to um, child in need of care kinds of things, health care, social issues, as well as fiscal issues and helping government run more efficiently. I think there's a, a relationship there. It's very clear. What without wishing to pin you down, what ambitions or hopes or wild guesses do you have for your future in the legislature? What do you plan to stay a long time? Do you hope to stay a long time? Would you like to be part of the leadership? Where do you think you're going in the legislature? I, I plan to be in the legislature. Um, I plan to have a leadership position at some point in time. Um, that's one of my targets that's down the road. Right now, my primary interest is making certain that I do a good job where I am right now and not taking on more than is necessary in order to do that job well. Turning to um, your private life, and please do feel free to say, hey, I don't want to talk about that. Okay. I'm very interested in what it means for a person especially a woman, to become a legislator. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to do is go back to your being able to leap into politics. You talked about it a little bit. You talked about your West Texas background. You talked about the fact that you grew up in an age that at least let men take risks. Would, do you have anything more you want to say about what you think it is in your family background um, that made you so clearly enjoy doing this and, and feel as though it's an area you're comfortable in. What makes you good at politics? 
Well, I think the first thing would be that I enjoy it. Um, and I would say in terms of background, I had a father who was a real risk taker and a mother who, was incredibly sen who is incredibly sensitive to people and operates kind of with a mission. So I had those two um, people as models. Um, I, my, my mother at the age of 60 went back to uh, school, trained and worked until she was 75 Good um, and had never worked out of the home. So she had time. been a traditional housewife? She had been a traditional housewife and she and my dad had a very traditional relationship. I recall uh, bantering with her about that. <laughs> I think I might have, have been, actually, I think growing up, I was probably the contentious one in the family, but um, generally spent a lot of time out and about doing things and, and stirring things up and um, enjoying being you know, in the community and involved in activities. But um, I think I think growing up in uh, in an in an area that's the West. I mean, some of the ethic. Actually, my family grew up. It was an oil family. Mm -hmm. But what I find is close similarities between the ethic of people who are in the oil business and farmers. They are gamblers. They are risk takers. They have a tremendous amount of faith in themselves. And um, so I, that was a big influence on me, I think. What did your mother go back to school to study? What nursing. She, nursing. She went back to nursing. And was your father well and alive at that time? Or? Uh -huh. Okay. And but it was a real risk for her. Yes. And she was, at, she was at the point, I mean, she is now 77. Mm -hmm. She was at the point where it was something that she had always wanted to do and um, thought, well, why not? Now, whether or not she made those decisions after seeing her daughters balance things differently than she did so that it challenged her, mm -hmm. or, you know, I can't say what motivated her necessarily, but... Um, Anyway, it's, it's made it a lot of fun. I mean, in a sense, she's been an encouragement to mm -hmm. me that you can continue to contribute for years. Mm -hmm. That's very impressive. Now, you were one of how many children? Four. Four children? Mm -hmm. I'm the second. You're the second? Uh -huh. You have brothers? I have a younger brother. And, and an older sister and a younger That's sister? Right. right. That's interesting. Um, What kind of impact has it had on your family that you are doing all of this? Um, is there a cost? I don't necessarily mean financial, although certainly um, I understand it can be expensive, especially your first mm -hmm. campaign. What has changed with your family when you took on this very large commitment? Well, a couple of things come to mind. Um, when I first ran, my daughter was three, mm -hmm. and I had a son who was nine. Um, and she was thrilled seeing all these yard signs, and she would say, oh, there's a March Petty sign, there's a March Petty, there's a March Petty. Well, at the time, she was really playing with Barbies regularly, which concerned me, and I said, well, <laughs> uh, you know, what does Barbie do for a living, Megan? And she said, well, Barbie runs. And I said, well, what does Ken do for a living? And she said, well, he, did, he used to work, but he quit his job, and now he runs with Barbie. <laughs> so at a, a three-year-old, her perception was that that's what women do, that they run, <laughs> either literally, which I was doing, or figuratively. <laughs> that's wonderful. But as she, when she was seven, she said to me, you know, Mom, I think I'm going to be a pediatrician, and described in great detail what she was going to be doing. And mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, what, and she said, and I'm going to have a husband with a mustache. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, I certainly haven't taught her to be very flexible. And uh, I said, well, what is he going to do for a living? And she said, you know, I don't know. I don't care. So in answer to your question about one of the impacts, mm -hmm. I think it has provided a model for my daughter mm -hmm. 
that women have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. And when I was seven, I don't know that I would have thought that growing up mm -hmm. in a semi-Southern culture um, with a mother who was home full time. So that's one, one positive thing. I think it's also had some positive impact on my son, seeing women uh, take leadership roles that have some, uh, some power as part of it. When I first ran, the first um, and, I don't want to minimize, I could not have done it without a lot of support from my husband in mm -hmm. terms of, he's a wonderful parent. Um, he was willing to pick up a lot of the logistics when I wasn't home mm -hmm. to do that. When I first ran uh, for city council, I gave him one of the tasks and it wasn't one he was really well suited for. So when I ran for the Senate, I said, Ty, you don't have to be part of this at all. You don't have to do a thing. And I would love it if you would go door to door with me when you've got time. Mm -hmm. But you, this is my thing. Mm -hmm. You've got your thing. I would welcome you if you want to be part of it, but you need not feel under every, any obligation. And it was wonderful. I mean, on the days he had a little bit of extra time free and I was going door to door, he'd join me and he, he was wonderful. I mean, he's great with people and it was fun. And when he wasn't there, that was fun too. And it was just the two of us that went door to door. I didn't take any friends or any big names because I wanted it to be very personal. Mm -hmm. So there have, it has been p participation by the family. On the negative side, I think it does put a strain on the family. There's an incredible amount of time commitment. And my children are still relatively young mm -hmm. and were even younger when I first got into politics. So I have worked very hard to try to keep that balance there mm -hmm. and to respect their need for privacy as well as their need to have me around. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been sort of a daily uh, reassessment continuing continually resetting priorities and so forth. Now your husband's a minister, mm -hmm. so that gives him a fairly flexible oh. work schedule, which doesn't mean he doesn't do a lot of work, no. but... No. He works for Storm and Vale, so he oh. has a full-time... He is he's not particularly flexible, okay. other than he's a department head, so it's the flexibility that comes with being a, of a man managerial status. Okay. But, um, no, so it's, it's, you know, it's required a lot of um, communication just on logistics, <laughs> you know, who's doing the laundry and, um, you know, what time can you be home and, you know, I've got to go to a meeting at 6.30. And the first year during the legislature, I tried to do everything. The second year, I told my secretary, don't schedule me anything after 6.30. I will do everything between 5 and 6.30, I'll go to three different receptions and spend 20 minutes each there. Mm -hmm. um, don't schedule me for anything or I'll be there longer than that. With, and there are exceptions, you know, but generally I made it a point last year to be home by 6.30 and it worked relatively well. This year, for the first time, we're going to have somebody come in mm -hmm. regularly. Uh, which I think will be wonderful. <laughs> Somebody who will cook. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Could you do this if you didn't live in Topeka? There are women who do, and they do a wonderful job. I don't know that I could personally do that or that I would personally make those sacrifices mm -hmm. because the model that I had growing up was a woman who was home full time. Mm -hmm. And the jobs that I have fashioned have been those that allowed me the kind of flexibility that I could keep one foot in a professional life and one foot at home and always be able to to juggle those mm -hmm. depending on what priority existed at the time. And that's been real valuable to me. Mm -hmm. And knowing myself well enough to know that that I need that, I've fashioned a job that I can do that. I've got my own consulting business that I can say yes or no to anytime. And when I was, let's see, when my daughter was an infant and I was still nursing her, she would go with me. 
and I'd line up a sitter and nurse her at noontime and play with her in the evening and do a workshop during the day. It's important to me to be able to balance those things. The people from, the women from Western Kansas, um, one has grown children, the other has a husband who uh, farms, and so he's free during the winter, and they move the children here. So it's interesting to see how all the women have ended up um, juggling all their commitments. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe I represent the, the 21st century woman who really wants it all. And knowing that I can't do it all 100%, 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. but Tell me some more about your jobs. That's one of the things that's very interesting, is what kind of job anyone, male or female, can have that eventually lets them be a legislator. Because certainly there are certain occupations mm -hmm. that just don't go away, or not go away, but let mm -hmm. you be. Mm -hmm. Could you trace through your, your, your occupational progression that got you where you're at, which is a lawyer consultant? Um, what sure. kinds of jobs have you had? Um, when I first moved to Topeka, I, I went back to KU for my master's degree. Um, I worked in state government for four years with the Department of Health and Environment as a consultant for the Bureau of Maternal and Child Health, which was consistent with what I had done when we lived in Chicago before moving here. Now, what was your master's degree in? Uh, counseling. Counseling. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked, what I, what I did through that particular job, and uh, my son was three at the time, I realized just for my personal, for being able to create that balance in my life that I wanted to go back to work when he was three. And so I balanced those kinds of things. I mean, it wasn't always easy. I it was it. not <laughs> easy. No, it was not easy. What I learned from that, though, Sarah, was that what I really needed was the flexibility that so many women today do not have, mm -hmm. particularly single mothers, who have to have who have to be at work at eight o'clock, and yet their child doesn't go to school until eight thirty. Mm -hmm. The incredible logistics. I it was important to me to have the flexibility that I could be at home until eight thirty until my child went off to school. Um, those kinds of things. So. What I did after I, after I had my second child, I developed a consulting firm that was dependent in part from a network of people that I had developed over those four years. And um, basically they would call for one-day workshops on program planning, uh, personnel management, some financial mm -hmm. assessment in terms of just the way their organization operated. Mm -hmm. um, and I could say yes or no, mm -hmm. and I did consulting all throughout the Midwest. At one point, I um, was a subcontractor with a federal project mm -hmm. and provided the, um, and my office was in Kansas City, and I provided the management for a 10-state area, out, what would have been HEW, mm -hmm. out of the Kansas City office and out of the Chicago office, and basically managed a consultant contract for them. I would provide some of the consultation on request, or I would match people up, mm -hmm. you know, with problems, basically. Um, and then that evolved into, um, I was particularly interested in the corporate and financial kinds of things. So I guess what I would say is that I'm more of an expert in process. Um, Go ahead, it's and, and, and it was very important to me to just keep my ears open for things that were available that I was interested in. I did a, um, as part of that consultant, I um, did some parenting education classes at Stormont and mm -hmm. did a neonatal assessment on one day old infants. Um, and I worked with a uh, teenage pregnancy project at Minickers and did some uh, parental assessment on videotapes, which was just fascinating. But all these kinds of things, including the uh, business consultation, which I've done with about eight corporations, um, they were the kinds of things where I could say, I will be there at such and such a time, and that they were very task specific as opposed to time specific. Mm -hmm. So that they knew what 
I knew what they needed and they knew what my commitment was, but that I could work it around the other commitments that I had made with family and with the legislature. Now, I will have to say that slowed down considerably the last two years because of, I want to make certain that there are no conflicts. Mm -hmm. Plus, I was in law school, completing a law degree, too, so there was only so much I could do. <laughs> so with this, yes, with this <laughs> consulting business, why did you go to law school? Law school really came out of my experience on the city council. And I served with a mayor who was a lawyer and three other lawyers. What I felt I brought to that forum was um, some skills they didn't have, but they had skills I didn't have. And I felt if I was going to get my legislation through and be effective, that I needed to at least understand their skills and be able to understand how they thought. So that was really the motivation to go to law school. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's held me in good stead in the legislature as well, because you, not only do you understand the language, which can get pretty technical at times, but it develops a process of thinking where you anticipate better what arguments are going to be, and you don't ask a question unless you know the answer already. <laughs> I like that. Do you ever plan to practice as a lawyer? I hope to do that. You hope to? Uh -huh. And I'm particularly interested in working in cities. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, all this pulls together. Mm -hmm. um, it does. So we've done most of this. Um, since you've been in the legislature, of course that isn't a very long time, but also since you've been in politics, has, have you changed anything about how you feel about yourself or where you want to go in life? <laughs> Gotta think on this one. Um, yes, I think I have. How has it changed? Um, I don't think that you can campaign door to door in 25 different precincts, um, talk to two-thirds of, um, of a district, which is very, uh, very different. I mean, my district goes all the way from downtown to... It goes all the way from downtown to, it includes a rural area. You can't go to door to door with people like, and have them let you into their lives just for a few moments and not be changed in some way. It's great. Wait a second. Okay. You know, if, if I were to put my thing, um, my finger on the single most important influence, mm -hmm. I think it has been that that experience had br has broadened my perspective of life. Um, you know, it's been wonderful. And, and, and in addition to that, that willingness to, um, that the forum itself forced me to put myself out to those people and, and be with them. Mm -hmm literally on the doorstep or with their particular situation, um, you know, it pushes you out of your box, basically. Makes sense. If you had to say either your greatest strength and your greatest weakness in politics or even what strengths and weaknesses you have as a politician, what would you say? I would say, first of all, that I think I've got the ability to see different, lots of different points of view. That uh, <laughs> the first year in, at the city council level, I think I was aware there must be 5,000 different points of view, and they all were right. <laughs> <laughs> at least from the point of view of the people who were saying them. But 
Um, so I think my strength is that I do listen to people mm-hmm. and I do understand their perspective. And as a result, I think much of what I've tried to do has been a, an, uh, an accumulation of those thoughts rather than um, being elitist enough to think that I always know all the answers. Okay, I think okay. that's that's one of my strengths. Got any weaknesses at all? Or areas uh, you want to work on? <laughs> uh, sure. I think that the, uh, the weak side of that kind of thing is that um, sometimes you listen too much and don't act fast enough. Um, okay. You know, I think the, uh, I don't know that speed is the issue, but I am much more inclined to want to make certain I figured out all the possible implications and um, and I actually, in terms of a weakness as a politician, I'm much more interested in things that I think are going to have long-term impact. But a weakness is that most politicians really love the media, mm-hmm. and and you know relish that. That was the hardest thing for me to get used to. So um, the way I go about doing things is not as um, quick in terms of being um, flashy okay. <laughs> and that kind of thing. Uh, Makes sense to me. That's probably not the best way to say I have it. a question that I really meant to ask earlier. Why are you Democrat? Why am I Democrat? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good question considering that I grew up in the community where George Bush raised his children mm-hmm. and as a matter of fact went to uh, <laughs> And which is extremely Republican. Went to school with George Bush Jr. In fact, a, a good friend of mine married, and okay. with whom I kept mm-hmm. in touch quite a bit. My choice in being a Democrat was just that. It was a choice as opposed to doing what seemed to be the thing to do. Mm-hmm. And is your family? Um, Republican. Republican. Oh, dad. Dad was definitely Republican. Mother never said. <laughs> I've heard that before. Both ways. Both ways. <laughs> and mother grew up in Chicago. And interestingly enough, you know, they they represented two extremes. You know, my dad's family had plantations. My mom's family um, were part of the Underground Railroad in Boston and had politics in her family. So, you know, I. I saw both sides of that, I think, and um, when I was old enough to register to vote, there was never any question but that I felt like a Democrat, Mm -hmm. and I think part of it was the people orientation and um, people versus bricks and mortar. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. an oversimplification. Now, you... I think we're the same age. You graduated from high school in 64 and mm-hmm. college in 68. Mm-hmm. Do you think it was your college years that did it? The whole youth revolution made you Democrat? Or, uh, no, I think the major difference was moving to Chicago because I went to school in the South. Um, one of the big issues in college was whether or not you could stay out past 10 o'clock or wear slacks to class. Mm-hmm. So, I mean... <laughs> the I remember it. <laughs> But I think, you know, for me, Sarah, the major, I, uh, I felt like I woke up when I moved north and I commuted downtown, you know, through model cities areas, through uh, the juxtaposition of the uh, Hancock building and mm-hmm. an urban renewal area and uh, worked in downtown Chicago traveled throughout that entire city, including the South Side, spoke at high schools on the South Side, uh, worked with the Model Cities program, worked with the AMA, was really involved with Chicago. But it was so different than anything I had grown up in. And I used to stand, I, I mean, I was like a kid. I would stand in front of the corner at lunchtime at Carson Perry Scott and just watch the people going by the area I'd grown up with, 
for upping was very homogeneous. And mm -hmm. I absolutely thrived on the heterogeneity and the fact that you could walk down the street and hear Victor Frankl talk. Well, I'd read his book in high school, but I never believed he was a real person mm -hmm. who I could just walk around the corner and listen to. Heard Jesse Jackson speak, went down to Breadbasket. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Cannonball Adderley was there. And, I mean, some wonderful experiences when I was 22, you know, 22 through about 25. And um, it really woke me up. I and somehow the way you woke up was facing Democrat rather than mm -hmm. the well, what That's should I great. Do? I woke up facing <laughs> Democrat. That's the truth. <laughs> what sh else should I have been asking you? What maybe haven't I talked about that you think is important to get down as a woman legislator? Woman legislator person? I don't know. Maybe it is perhaps that um, my belief that women can help change the system in a way that's never happened before. And that is bringing um, an additional perspective and sensitivity and um, willingness to negotiate and not be not dogmatic, but challenging the previous system to look at some new things. And I, I'm very hopeful that we can have that influence. Me too. Well, this has been wonderful.